History of the Desert in Las Vegas. Wilbur Clark wanted to go out west, so he hitchhiked from Illinois to San Diego, where he got a job as a bellman at the Knickerbocker Hotel. Clark eventually owned 13 bars in San Diego, and on his second trip to Las Vegas in 1944, he bought a majority share of the El Rancho Vegas, which was the first resort built on the Strip in 1941. He also leased a small casino downtown called the Monte Carlo. Wilbur had thousands of silver dollar keepsakes made to give to his friends now that he had struck it rich. Clark realized that once World War II was over, Americans would want to travel, and he wanted to build the best resort on the Strip. At the time, there were three resorts on the Strip, and the Thunderbird was under construction as the fourth resort. Clark sold his shares of the El Rancho Vegas and Monte Carlo for about $1.5 million and started construction in 1946 on the Desert Inn, which was the name of a hotel in Palm Springs that Wilbur really liked. Because of the war, supplies were expensive and scarce, so Wilbur had to stop construction in 1947. Clark was unable to get financing from normal sources, and the locals began to make fun of the half-built resort. In 1949, in order to secure the funding to complete his Dream Vegas Resort, Wilbur sold 74% of the Desert Inn to Cleveland-based mob boss Mo Dallitz, who got money from the Teamster Union's Central States Pension Fund. But Wilbur Clark would remain manager of the Desert Inn. The Nevada Tax Commission hesitated to give a gaming license to the Desert Inn because Mo Dallitz was involved, so one of the Desert Inn minority investors had a meeting with Nevada U.S. Senator Pat McCarran, and afterwards the license was approved. For the second time in just a few years, the mob came to the financial rescue of an uncompleted Vegas casino. This is when the mob realized how easy it would be to own a Vegas casino, as long as there were frontmen. Despite being a minority owner, Wilbur Clark wanted his name on the hotel sign, and Mo Dallitz agreed. Wilbur Clark's Desert Inn opened on Monday, April 24, 1950, at a cost of about $4.5 million, with a two-day gala opening. $5,700 was spent to cover airfare for journalists from around the country. 150 invitations went out to VIPs with a credit limit of $10,000, but about half of the attendees were from Nevada and California. Clark and Dallas both wanted the best resort on the Strip, and they made sure the Desert Inn was better than even the just-completed Flamingo down the street. Vegas, Nevada can boast of many things, and rightfully so. This resort hotel on the famous Strip is known the world over for its warm and friendly atmosphere. Here the visitor will learn that recreation is truly unlimited. The 300 rooms started at $5 a night, and each room included the innovative technology of individual room thermostats to control the air conditioning. From his room, the guest can look out upon a scene of tropical splendor. The patio and pool area is always a very popular place with the vacationer. Here one can spend many carefree hours swimming in the Olympic-sized pool or getting a coat of tan, just relaxing in the warm Nevada sunshine. Almost every day, famous personalities of the entertainment world can be seen poolside, taking time out from the strain of show business. However, these young people are not paid performers, but guests who find the high and low diving boards a good place to have some fun. Speaking of professionals, here is the young and talented actress, Gina Gennardi. She's informed us that we hadn't seen anything until we watched her on the high diving board. Oh, no! Well, as long as you come up with a finish like this, we'll forgive you, Gina. Overlooking the patio, there is a health club with facilities for both men and women. 
The 2,400 square foot casino was the largest in Las Vegas. In 1950, about 10% of all Nevada employees worked for a casino and made on average $4,100 a year. With 350 employees, the Strip Resort was the largest employer in the state. The Desert Inn was the first hotel in Vegas to have a fountain at the entrance and it shot water 50 feet into the air. The Sky Room Lounge was on the third floor which overlooked the pool and the dancing waters, which was a series of fountains that were set to music and lit up by colored lights. The Sky Room Lounge, high atop our hotel, overlooking Las Vegas' famous strip, is one of the most popular spots in town with the after-theater crowds. Here, old friendships are renewed and new friends are made. Many of Hollywood's brightest stars find this room with its cosmopolitan atmosphere an ideal place to host their friends during their stay at Las Vegas. The first general manager came from one of the best hotels in San Francisco, while the chef had worked at the Ritz Paris in France and for the Duke of Windsor. A complete New York steak dinner cost $5.75, and a good breakfast plate was $2.50. Along with the restaurant, there were retail shops, including a barber and beauty shop. Next to the pool was a daycare center for kids that was staffed by a psychologist and it had murals on the wall teaching good manners. The Desert Inn quickly became known by locals and regulars as the DI. Hank Greenspun was the first publicity director for the hotel, but three weeks after the grand opening, he started the Las Vegas Sun newspaper. The first week profits exceeded a half a million dollars and the first year profits was nearly two million dollars and that is after Mo Dallitz skims money from the hotel. Dallitz became one of the first mobsters to hide his money offshore at the notorious Castle Bank in the Bahamas. In 1951 Wilbur Clark tried to get the other casino owners together to build a golf course to promote Las Vegas but they didn't think a golf course would work in Vegas. So Clark built a one million dollar golf course and country club by himself but the locals called it Wilbur's Folly because nobody thought people would play golf in the Vegas heat. The DI became the only golf course in the country to host three tour championships in one year, two from the PGA Tour and one from the LPGA Tour. The Country Club, located only a short distance from the pool area, provides the golfer, professional or amateur alike, with every service. Additional facilities recently added house a spacious dining room, club room, and a terrace on the roof where dances are held under the stars for the enjoyment of everyone. From the clubhouse roof, one can get an unobstructed view of the entire 165 acres that comprise the 18-hole championship golf course, rated as being one of the finest in the world. 35-year-old Frank Sinatra made his Las Vegas debut at the Desert Inn on September 4, 1951, in the 450-seat Crystal Room. Las Vegas Sun publisher described Sinatra by what many people already knew, a homely kid with a sweet, natural appeal. While the entertainment reporter forecast of the future, one of the greatest showmen seen in these parts. But this was a low point in Frank Sinatra's life because his career had yet to take off and there was public outrage towards Sinatra because he was divorcing Nancy to be with MGM movie star Ava Gardner, who was making more money than Frank at the time. Sinatra was like a schoolboy around Ava, but they were fighting like cats and dogs, including one fight just weeks earlier in Carson City where Ava got pulled over for speeding after the fight, and Frank had to tell a reporter, suicide is the farthest thought from my mind. Sinatra was sick in bed from what appeared to be an overdose, but he said it was just a bellyache. The Morning Journal ran with the headline, Did Frankie Take Overdose of Sleeping Pills? But authorities, at least publicly, did not think there was a suicide attempt. Ava Gardner's presence overshadowed Frank Sinatra's Vegas debut at the Desert Inn because the press and public were so interested in the steamy affair. After the first show, Sinatra told a reporter 
that he was going to Lake Mead with Ava to boat and fish on his new 24-foot cabin cruiser. Two months later, on November 1st, Sinatra finalized the divorce with Nancy, spending 15 minutes in the courthouse, and Frank did not like the press attention, saying, I ought to give a cocktail party for the press and put a Mickey in every glass. The PR man for the Desert Inn was the required witness for the divorce. Within a week, Ava Gardner got married a third and last time to Frank Sinatra in Philadelphia, and Ava said in her autobiography that Frank was the love of her life. But they got divorced six years later. Sinatra's second and last contract with the Desert Inn was in July 1952. By 1953, Frank could pick his hotel, and his glory days in Vegas were just beginning at the Sands Hotel, which included the Rat Pack years. Frank Sinatra would go on to say, Wilbur Clark gave me my first job in Las Vegas. That was 1951. For six bucks, you got a filet mignon dinner and me. Desert Inn Managing Director Allard Rowan helped desegregate the Las Vegas Strip in the 1950s because desegregation didn't happen until the 1960s. In fact, some people called Las Vegas the Mississippi of the West. Allard got Sammy Davis Jr. onto the Whites-only Desert Inn golf course despite pushback. Allard also helped Pearl Bailey get a black choir as her backup singers when she left the Desert Inn to perform at the Flamingo Hotel. Frank Sinatra was also a strong advocate for getting the strip desegregated, using his power to give black people access and jobs in the casinos. Especially in the later years at the Sands Hotel, where he had a much longer engagement. But Frank Sinatra continued to deliver racial remarks at Sammy Davis Jr. on stage during their shows. The first atomic testing at the Nevada test site, northwest of Las Vegas, was on January 27, 1951. About 1,000 atomic tests were conducted over four decades, and in the 1950s, the city marketed Las Vegas as Atomic City. The Desert Inn quickly became known for hosting dawn bomb parties in their panoramic sky room, which was the highest vantage point on the Strip. The third floor sky room had a view of the atomic bombs that were exploding about 65 miles away at the Nevada test site. A bomb went off about every three weeks and the tremors were felt on the strip. The flash from the explosion could be seen in neighboring states. There were also misatomic bomb pageants with the last and most famous winner being Lee Merlin in 1957. Wilbur and Tony Clark became one of the top couples in Las Vegas. An invitation to have dinner at their home, which was on the golf course, was highly coveted. Their home had the latest technology, including a master bedroom TV that retracted into the ceiling. The Clark's pool was similar to the indoor pool at Hearst Castle in Central California. They also promoted the DI and the city of Las Vegas during their world travels. In 1957, Edward R. Merle of CBS interviewed the Clarks and toured their home for the TV program, Person to Person. Wilbur Clark, the genial host at the inn which bears his name, and his charming wife, Tony, are often seen in the patio greeting old friends. Mr. Clark was among the first to pioneer the development of what is considered the most exciting three miles in the world, Las Vegas' famous strip. While his civic duties are many, he always finds time to meet his guests. On November 18, 1958, Tony Martin signed a $1 million deal with the Desert Inn, which was the highest total salary for a Las Vegas performer. Martin had just finished a 10-year gig with the Flamingo, and this five-year deal would pay him $25,000 a week. In 1959, Nevada passed the Gaming Control Act, which was the beginning of the modern era of gaming regulations. The mob was still able to continue skimming from the casinos, 
until the 1980s, but the law created the Nevada Gaming Commission, which approved gaming licenses instead of the Nevada Tax Commission. The commission issued a regulation that said casino operators could lose their gaming license for catering, assisting, employing, or associating with, either socially or in business affairs, persons of notorious or unsavory reputation. The commission came up with the initial list of 11 mobsters who would be banned for life from Nevada casinos. The list of excluded persons came to be known as the Black Book, or known hoodlums. But Cleveland mob boss and Desert Inn owner Mo Dallitz was not in the Black Book because he had become a respected casino executive in town. Because, while the FBI concluded in 1964 that Dallitz had long been one of the top hoodlums directing Las Vegas operations, Mo was a good citizen and a man who invested in the town. Larry Gray continued by saying in his book, the man behind the Desert Inn was the individual most responsible for the success of the Las Vegas Strip in the 1950s. Mo Dallas said his biggest achievement was the construction of the Las Vegas Convention Center in 1959 because it made Vegas more than just a gambling town. When the godfather of Las Vegas died in 1989, he was called Las Vegas' most distinguished citizen for four decades. Before the Black Book was formally released, two of the mobsters were spotted by a sheriff deputy at the Desert Inn on February 7, 1960. L.A. mobsters Louis Dragna and John Battaglia were dancing with their wives at the Sky Room Lounge when they were both arrested for vagrancy, and they were shocked by the public arrest. Thirteen major casinos got this notice when the list of excluded persons was released. The notoriety resulting from hoodlums visiting Nevada gaming establishments tends to discredit not only the gaming industry, but our entire state as well. In order to avoid the possibility of license revocation, your immediate cooperation is requested in preventing the presence in any license establishment of all persons of notorious or unsavory reputation, including the above individuals, as well as those who subsequently may be added to the list. The Black Book would eventually include casino cheaters, and as of the year 1999, there have been 49 people on the list. Black Book mobster Marshall Caifano walked into the Desert Inn for a drink, but the cocktail waitress wouldn't come by. So Caifano went to the bar, and the bartender wouldn't serve him. Desert Inn's Alan Rowan told Marshall, we might lose our license if you don't leave. Marshall replied, You guys are not going to throw me out. You better not touch me. Marshall left on his own, but not before getting into a losing fist fight with a Las Vegas Sun photographer. Marshall Caifano was eventually removed from the Black Book after his death. In 1961, Liz Taylor disguised herself as a waitress and heckled her husband, Eddie Fisher, while he was performing at the Desert Inn. And he had no idea until Liz Taylor took off her disguise. In 1964, Wilbur Clark organized the first professional football game in Las Vegas for his charity, which was a preseason AFL game between the Oakland Raiders and Houston Oilers. Al Davis was a Raiders head coach, and this game planted a seed in Davis that Vegas might be a good place for football. Also in 1964, Wilbur Clark sold his share of the Desert Inn due to failing health and died a year later of a heart attack at the age of 56. Bell Captain Jack Butler said, Wilbur was the greatest guy. Without him, this town never would have gotten off the ground. Everyone came into the club just to see him, and he was all over the postcards. He was the only boss who would agree to have his picture taken. Wilbur Clark would hand these postcards out about Abraham Lincoln's life, which was likely similar to his life. In the 1960s, the FBI was also coming after the mob, but the mob had some pretty good connections. 
And in June of 1966, the governor called for the prosecution of the FBI for illegally wiretapping casinos, including the Desert Inn. On November 27, 1966, 61-year-old reclusive billionaire Howard Hughes arrived in Las Vegas on a special Union Pacific train. He stayed on the top floor of penthouse of the Desert Inn, and the press initially did not know he was in town, which is what he preferred. But it only took a few days for the media to find out. After a serious airplane accident 20 years earlier, Hughes was in a slow decline due to addiction to prescription drugs and other problems, including a serious case of obsessive-compulsive disorder and germophobia. Eventually, Mo Dallitz wanted Hughes to leave because high rollers were coming in for the holidays and Hughes didn't gamble. Mo had intense conversations with Howard about leaving until Howard asked Mo, how much do you want for the DI? Dallitz gave an inflated price of about $14 million and Howard said, okay. Howard Hughes once said, just remember, there's no one I can't buy or destroy. The sale of the Desert Inn was finalized on March 27, 1967. The penthouse floor became the private residence of the eccentric mogul, while the floor below became the business offices. Howard stayed in the 250-square-foot bedroom and very rarely left for four years. Hughes would do business by phone or write notes to his staff while he was usually naked. Very few people, even his staff, ever saw him personally. The windows were always covered and the door was sealed shut with tape. Howard had such a strong case of germophobia that he did not allow the hotel staff to come in and clean the room. Hughes refused to go to the required public meeting to apply for a Nevada gaming license which was needed to own the Desert Inn. The governor of Nevada pleaded with state officials to waive the public meeting requirement because Howard Hughes was so rich and famous that it would be great for Las Vegas if he owned a casino. Howard got his way, and he is widely regarded as the person who got Nevada to change the gaming laws so that the owners of the casino did not have to go through a background check. This made it possible for public corporations to own Nevada casinos because it is impossible to investigate all the shareholders of a large public corporation. Along with the FBI and Nevada authorities cracking down on the mob, this ushered in the corporate takeover of the Las Vegas Strip in the late 1970s. Howard Hughes then told his right-hand man, Robert Mayhew, to buy as many Vegas casinos as you can. Howard went on a buying spree and bought the Sands, Castaways, the Frontier, the Landmark, while he also bought 25,000 acres in the Las Vegas Valley, including land that would become Summerlin. In 1988, Howard's company, Summa Corporation, would start to build the Summerlin community, which is named after Howard's grandmother, Jean Summerlin. But Jean Nevada is not named after Jean Summerlin. By the 1970s, Hughes became the largest individual landowner in the state and Nevada's largest employer with 8,000 employees. Hughes was a war hawk because he was a defense contractor, but he didn't like the nuclear bomb testing in the Nevada desert because it was shaking his penthouse room and because of the environmental damage. So he wrote a letter to President Johnson and he contacted the Atomic Energy Commission to get them to stop the nuclear bomb testing. Years later, Philip Coyle, the former test director at the Nevada test site, said that they actually moved one test 100 miles further to the north, away from Las Vegas, because of Howard's complaints, to see if the shaking would be reduced on the Strip. On January 19, 1968, a nuclear test was conducted at this remote site, and the shaking on the Strip was not reduced. So this would be the only testing done at this remote location because everything was already set up for testing closer to the Strip. In 1968, Hughes bought the local CBS affiliate KLAS, and he would call up the station to have them play his favorite movies. If Howard fell asleep while watching a movie, 
he would call the station when he woke up and tell them to replay the movie. Johnny Carson joked, Welcome to Las Vegas, Howard Hughes' Monopoly set. You ever get the feeling he's going to buy the whole damn place and shut it down? Frank Sinatra said on stage, You're wondering why I don't have a drink in my hand. Well, Howard Hughes bought it. Hughes tried to buy the Stardust, but the Justice Department began a Monopoly lawsuit against Hughes, which ended the buying spree. In 1970, the 14,000-member Culinary Workers Union and Bartender Union started a strike for better wages. Showgirls and musicians joined the strike, which was the first full-scale work stoppage on the Strip, but the downtown casinos were not involved. Sixteen strip hotels, including the Desert Inn, were largely shut down, except for some gambling, because dealers were not part of the union. Many Americans saw Howard Hughes as a hero who was driving out the mob and making Vegas more respectable, but the mob was still skimming money from the casinos because they still had connections to employees who were running the casinos. Hughes left the Desert Inn and Las Vegas in November 1970, never to return, and died in 1976. They actually needed fingerprints to confirm his ID because Howard Hughes was in such decline and very few people saw him in person. Teeing it up at the Desert Inn Country Club and Spa in fabulous Las Vegas is more than just playing golf on one of the nation's finest courses. It's experiencing the luxury of a new world-class spa. It's feeling the elegance of impeccably appointed guest rooms. It's tasting the exotic cuisines of faraway places. It's smashing a tennis ball or soaking in the warm Nevada sunshine. It's knowing you've arrived. In the 1990s, the Desert Inn was starting to show her age compared to the new larger resorts opening on the Strip. In 1992, the Desert Inn convinced Frank Sinatra to have his 77th birthday celebration at the Crystal Room, where he had his Vegas debut 41 years earlier. When Frank was about to go on stage, he said, I wish I didn't need to do this, but she keeps on spending so much money. In 2000, 37-year-old Monte Carlo cocktail waitress Cynthia J was celebrating the birthday of her boyfriend's mother when they couldn't get tickets to a show, so instead they went to the Desert Inn. Cynthia was a lone player on a bank of six megabuck progressive machines when it took only nine spins at the minimum $3 to win the world's largest slot jackpot at $35 million. Since then, there has only been one bigger jackpot in 2003. Cynthia gave her two-week notice at the Monte Carlo, paid off the debts of her family members, got married within weeks, and was hoping to have three children. Six weeks later, Cynthia was driving with her sister when they were hit from behind by a drunk driver at a red light. Her sister was killed instantly, and Cynthia was paralyzed from the chest down and is unable to have children. Three months later, the Desert Inn celebrated its 50th anniversary on April 24, 2000, with a week-long celebration. There was an invitation-only dinner which served the same food that was served on the opening night in 1950. One of the speakers at the dinner said, For a change, Las Vegas was celebrating its history instead of tearing it down. Later that week, on April 27th, Steve Wynn bought the DI from Starwood for $270 million as a birthday gift to his wife Elaine. John Robinson said, The Desert Inn received what was perhaps the best birthday present it could possibly receive. The Desert Inn would once again have a caring owner. So far, the only plan Mr. Wynn has discussed about what he will do with the property is the possibility that he will tear it down and build something else. Please, Steve, don't tear down this building. Just three years earlier, Sheraton had spent $200 million on additions and renovations. Steve Wynn explained that the hotel was not that profitable, in part because the rooms were too small to compete with the newer mega resorts that he had recently built. Plus, one year earlier in 1999, Sheldon Adelson, 
opened a $1.5 billion Venetian right next door, and Steve wanted to build an even better resort. At 2 a.m. on a dreary rainy night on August 28, 2000, the doors of the Desert Inn closed for good. 90-year-old former Bell Captain Jack Butler said, I was the first one in, so I wanted to be the last one out. It's very sad. I hang out here all the time since my wife died. My car only knows how to come to this place. Historian Michael Green said, To a lot of people outside of Las Vegas, these two places really meant Las Vegas. These were the places that represent the images of Las Vegas in a far greater way than the dunes, the Aladdin, the Hacienda, and the Landmark. In 2001, the Junior League of Las Vegas moved the Morelli House from the Desert Inn Country Club Estates to downtown to serve as their headquarters because Steve Wynn demolished all of the Country Club homes. The custom mid-century home was built in 1959 by Sands Hotel Orchestra leader Antonio Morelli, and the Rat Pack would rehearse in the music room. The house also hosted after-hour parties that included the Rat Pack, Nat King Cole, Tony Bennett, and Judy Garland. In 2001, the 42-year-old house still had the original carpet, but it has since been replaced, and the house is the only remaining structure from the Desert Inn and Country Club property. You're watching Eyewitness News at Noon with Polly Gonzalez and John Gilbert. Piece of Las Vegas strip history is no more. Part of the Desert Inn Hotel was imploded early this morning with hundreds of onlookers witnessing that event. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm John Gilbert. Polly is off today. The ground along the strip rumbled at about 2 this morning when the Desert Inn Hotel tower came crashing down. Eyewitness News reporter John Summers has more on the big blast. While a lot of people came to be part of the excitement, others will miss the Desert Inn. Oh, just a tad bit. <laughs> Good memories, though, really good memories. The Desert Inn uh, will always have a place in Las Vegas, yeah. Hotel casino developer Steve Wynn has big plans for the Desert Inn property. Last Friday, Wynn announced his new resort will be called La Reve, French for the Dream. Tony Clark said that she accepted the demise of the Desert Inn and was happy for Steve and Elaine because life changes. The Wynn Resort opened on April 27, 2005, three days after the 55th anniversary of the Desert Inn and five years to the day after Steve Wynn purchased the DI. At $2.7 billion, the Wynn was the most expensive privately funded construction project in the nation. In 2006, Tony Clark, who was considered the first lady of Las Vegas, died. The Las Vegas Sun said, Tony was a pioneer proponent of local high fashion and a civic leader who spent decades sponsoring and promoting cultural arts in Las Vegas. The Encore Tower opened on December 22, 2008, and the Wynn Resort is now the world's eighth largest hotel. Here are some of the entertainers that performed at the DI. The Copa Room at the Sands was the place to be for many years, but the Crystal Room at the Desert Inn had many of the same entertainers. And here are some films shot at the Desert Inn. And for Rush Hour 2, the DI was transformed into an Asian hotel casino for the film just before it was imploded. There were three time capsules buried over the years. One was buried in 1985 for the 35th anniversary, one in 1992 for Sinatra's birthday, and one was buried at the casino entrance for the 50th anniversary, which included gaming chips, menus, postcards, and employee photos from the last 50 years. The plaque for the 50th anniversary time capsule read, The Desert Inn Resort, Vegas, done right, since 1950. Time capsule buried on April 24, 2000, to commemorate the Desert Inn Resort's 50th birthday to be opened 50 years later on April 24, 2050. 
but there doesn't seem to be any information on where the time capsules are located or even if they are still buried under the Wynn Resort. 